o'clock, and then again, uh, the Christmas Eve services. But I, I just want to uh, just, I believe that, uh, again, asking, asking is a part of our culture. And, and before we begin, uh, um, we're going to be in chapter 7, verse 7 to 12. I want to pray, and uh, let's talk about asking. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless us in this uh, topic, especially at this time of the year. And we just pray, Lord, that you would, um, you would enter into our hearts and minds today with your Holy Spirit and help us to think through the issues. Uh, even as uh, Chris challenged us about the stress of this day and this week and the stresses, why are we being stressed? when uh, the peace that passes all understanding should be ours in Christ Jesus. So help us, Lord, to find that peace in the uh, season that we're in and help us to find the truth in this passage of Scripture. As we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. As was um, prayed for by uh, Elder Troy, uh, you know, we, the, the world is in a crazy place. I mean, there are wars all over the world. Uh, you know, and I, I, during this season, what are, what are people asking uh, in the way the world is today? What are the deepest questions that you hear people asking? Well, I hear people asking, you know, when is Kohl's open to tonight? I got to get my ship, shopping done. Or how can I get free shipping on this order? If I order one more thing, I get free shipping. Or Will it arrive before the 24th? Or what size did you say Johnny was again? I forgot. And of course the question is asked on sometimes Christmas here, do I have to assemble this? And then of course every kid is being asked in our world today, what do you want for Christmas? Are they the deep questions? Are they the ones that are going to change our perspective of the world? Well, um, I think the kids think so, right? I think they do. Of course, the question I've, I've, I've always been asking is, uh, who's the greatest reindeer of all? That's what I still want to know. I, I don't think reindeer, you know, uh, fly, but I just want to know who the greatest one. Anyway, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at Matthew 7, verses, uh, chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Follow along as I read uh, from the, the Gospel of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking to the multitude on the mount. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bed, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. We find it hard uh, sometimes, I think, to ask for help during the year. Uh, you, you know, we got a project going on, and we find out that we need maybe a second hand. We find it hard to ask for help. Uh, some people actually don't find it hard. I, I do find it hard. Um, it's hard to accept their offer of help. When people come up, they say, Pastor Mike, I want to I help you with that. And I say, no, I, I, I got this. We want to do it alone. Do it yourself books are flooding the shelves. Um, used to be books, bookstores. I don't think there's bookstores anymore. But anyway, flooding your your uh, email with, uh, you can do this yourself, or YouTube videos can show you everything from uh, changing the door on a, a, uh, a microwave oven to fixing your car. Do it yourself. When we, we really believe that uh, when someone asks, uh, you need some help? We believe this. No, I can do it myself. By the way, I hear a lot of two-year-olds saying that. Do you hear a lot of two- and three-year-olds saying that? No, I can do it myself. Leave me alone. I can do it myself. And I think God is uh, like a father, seeing the frustration 
of his children trying to get the chain back onto the bike. And he's just waiting as a father to be asked to help out. And somehow we don't want to talk to God about that. I, I like what Chris said. He's now praying and talking to God about all his frustrations. Do we do that? Should we do that? I believe we should. As a matter of fact, Jesus puts it this way. We need to ask. We need to seek. We need to knock. Uh, these, are, these are three ways in which we approach God. And I really believe they're kind of different. Uh, Jesus has encouraged us in the passages before to live righteously with a sincere, pure, non-judgmental, forgiving love. And that is hard to do. It is. Uh, especially when you're at the cash register and the person brings up the wrong price and you sold it as a sale price and you're wanting the 25% off and they're not taking the coupon and you're getting frustrated. And all of a sudden, your sincere, pure, non judgmental forgiving love is left in the car. And, and, and in reality, we need help to live the righteous life, the life of the saint, the life of a kingdom saint. We need we need God's help. And asking, seeking, and knocking. What is this all about? Well, I, I actually break it down. I think there's three different ways. Asking is being courteous and not demanding. Uh, seeking is being persistent, not passive. To, to, you're looking for something. You're asking questions, but you're also looking for something. and something to find. Knocking is being diligent, not, not easily dissuaded. And, and you want to open the door. You want this door to be open. And so you're a little bit more persistent. So it's almost like asking is the first level, seeking is the second level, and, and knocking is the third level. And then there's this one other level that Jesus is going to talk about. It's kicking down the door. I, that's, that's my level when I want something. It's, again, Jesus is trying to tell us something. The Greek is the present imperative verb, and you really don't care about the Greek, right? But it means you keep on asking. You keep on seeking. You keep on knocking. There's no limit to it. Now, some people will tell me, well, I prayed about this, and God has an answer. I, how many times have you prayed about it? Well, I prayed about it once, and he didn't answer. I've been praying for someone in my life for <laughs> 50 years. One of these days, God is going to answer me. You know, keep on. If God has put it on your heart, keep talking to him about it. Be persistent. Luke, 8, uh, Luke uh, chapter 11, 9, we are to ask for the Holy Spirit's power. In Matthew 21, 21, we're to ask to have faith and, and help with our downing. In John chapter 14, 13, we're to ask in Jesus' name for the spirit of truth that would come out of us. James Five, uh, one five says we're to ask for wisdom, and He is going to give it to us generously. And in that same in that same book, in chapter four, it says, "You do not have because you do not ask." Now, is there a way in which we ask for the wrong things? Absolutely. How many of your four-year-olds has asked for a, a twelve hundred cc motorcycle? Right? No. The answer is no. Uh, and if you did get them a 1,200cc motorcycle for a four-year-old, let me talk to you afterwards, okay? Because that's, there are inappropriate things that you ask for. I have, yes, yes, I have asked for inappropriate things. And, and of course, usually my kids laugh at me. You know, it's totally ridiculous. You've had your kids ask for things that are totally ridiculous. And if you're a good parent, hopefully you won't give them all the things they've asked for. So God is a good, good father. I love that song, by the way. We're encouraged to ask our good, good father, and uh, I believe this, uh, because he wants to give us good gifts. That's what Jesus said. He wants to give us good gifts. Most have experienced the father's love and care. Most of us are blessed by what God has given us. As Jan and I look back on our life and the, our three healthy sons and, uh, and just 
the house that we have and two cars that actually run and, and things like that. It's just a, it's a tremendous blessing. And, and honestly, that song, Count Your Blessings, I wish we'd bring that one back. Uh, as you focus on the good gifts that God has given you, he is a good, good father. And so Jesus compares it to another father, a worldly father, and he says, you know, here's a father. Is it really good for a father to give stones instead of bread or snake meat and not fish? And everybody's going, snake meat, oh, it's so bad. Well, you know, guess what? You know, when you're really hungry, snake meat is not so bad. It actually tastes like chicken. It really does. How many people here, I'm serious, how many people here have had snake meat? Come on, raise here. Look at this. See that? The rest of you need to try it. Um, in the Middle East, uh, snake meat was dried and salted. It looked a lot like the, the dried fish that they were eating. And the snake meat could be slipped in on a dish with other Jewish kids, and they wouldn't even notice the difference. But ex- Leviticus chapter 11 forbids the eating of snake. The snake was an unclean animal. It crawled on the ground. It picked up lots of diseases. So God actually forbade it. And most parents would not switch a stone for a dumpling. Can you imagine your kid eating and then you put a white stone in there with the rest of the dumplings and they break their teeth on it and you laugh at them. (laughs) Would that be good parenting, by the way? Now, I have been known to, to switch things uh, some ingredients with my kids. Uh, I think we had squirrel meat one time. I just figured that they needed to eat the squirrel meat. Because I was thinking that, you know, I'm training for mission, being a missionary, right? They're all training to be a missionary, so you got to eat some squirrel. And by the way, squirrel tastes like chicken. Um, but again, I wasn't doing it to break their teeth or to disobey God in, in serving snake meat that was forbidden by God, uh, I was doing it because I love my children, and I wanted them to uh, eat things. By the way, now my kids are making things for me with some exotic ingredients. Hey, Dad, try this. Okay. They want to make, see if I can, will eat what they had to eat. Anyway, so why would God, who is perfect, right, not give you Better things than your own parents would. That's what the Bible say. God is more concerned about you and giving you good gifts than your parents. Now, again, I, I'm going to obviously bring up the misconceptions that this passage talks about, uh, that Jesus is talking about when it comes to asking God for things. There's three misconceptions. God is not a reluctant, transcendent divinity who is cajoled in by your works uh, to get you a blessing. You know, God, if I do this and this and this and this, now will you give me the car I want? And we kind of deal with them. Oh, and you have to, you have to do a lot more work. So I did all these things for you. Why aren't you blessing me? you got to cajole him into giving you something. God's not like that. God's not a malicious tyrant who takes delight in not giving you what is asked. You know, God, you've been praying for this for 50 years. I'm still not giving it to you. I want to see you suffer. That's not like that. Or giving you something like, like, like a snake meat instead of a fish meat just to see you suffer. God's not like that. And the last thing, which brings me to this season of the year, because we do have a misconception of God. God is not an indulgent grandfather or a fairy godmother who will give you whatever you ask and just write the check. I think we've been teaching our kids that. We pull verses, ask, and it will be given to you. And we pull verses like that, and and our kids learn those verses in high school and said, I've been asking and asking for my... My Jaguar, and I still haven't gotten one. I think that was a 40-year-old uh, uh, kid. But <clears throat> The thing is, God is not an indulgent grandfather or a fairy godmother. He is God the Father in heaven who loves you 
so much that he wants to give you, and notice what it says, good gifts. Good gifts. And again, if we really try to figure that out, what is a good gift? He gives good gifts to fulfill his will in your life. He wants you to be filled with joy and life and truth and to do a purpose that he has for each one of us and he wants you to fulfill that purpose. And so he will give you good gifts to fulfill his will. Not your will. It's not your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes that's hard for us because I want what I want when I want it and I don't care about anybody else. And God says, well, you're on your own. Because I'm not going to give you anything when you're that selfish. Uh, you, you, you need to break out of that. And the only way you break out of that is to come to Jesus as Savior and Lord and, and understand that he wants good gifts for you. But he wants you to do his will. By the way, in this passage, Jesus says something that we just glossed over. But do you remember what he said in verse 11? Jesus says this. If you then, and he's talking to the entire crowd, if you then, though you are evil. Did everybody see that? Jesus, looking at the crowd, says, though you are evil, wait a second, did we miss that? Did Jesus just call us evil? By the way, he, he talked to the entire crowd. And by the way, if you look through the New Testament, there's more than one passage that says that we're evil. Uh, think about that. Everyone is evil? By the way, it's been being debated in our day. Matter of fact, it's been being debated for about, oh, I don't know, 2,000 years. Are we really that bad? Isn't there good in every one of us? We just, matter of fact, aren't we mostly good? By the way, if you think, if you believe, Pastor Mike is mostly good. <laughs> you don't know Pastor Mike. My, you know, my parents knew I wasn't mostly good. My friends, my wife, my loving wife. What, is it, what does it take for you to realize you're breaking your own rules? How many of you, no, don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever been on a diet? And you say, I'm going to be on a diet. January 1st, I'm going on a diet. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to do everything right. You make your list. You do your shopping for good foods, and you start out really good. Five days into it, and you pass a donut shop that, that you want a donut, and you eat a donut, and you break your own rules. We've all done it. We make our own rules, and then we break them. And somehow we say, ah, I just can't be this good. Have you ever said that? <laughs> I just can't be this good. And the answer is, you're right. You can't be that good. That's what John is saying. You, you're you have a, you're going to have a hard time being that good. I, God, want to help you. I want to save you from your sins. I want to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I want to have a relationship with you so close that you can live in the power of the Holy Spirit as a righteous saint of mine, as a child of mine, as a person who will show people who Jesus is in the way you live righteously. That's what he means. Actually, we are, you know, we have this bent toward evil. And, and Jesus knew that. He, he knew the sinfulness of all humanity. God is good, but the rest of us, the rest of us are not. Um, again, I thought of this, uh, you know, if you want to sit with me for a day of hearings at the county courthouse, 
go with me. That's one of the things we had to do in a course in, uh, in, at seminary, was spend two days in the county courthouse and listening to one person after another person, good people, upstanding citizens, who had a bent toward evil and got caught. And you're going, this is really depressing. You know, after one day, you were depressed. The second day, I was saying, you know what? I think God is right. Think of the wars in the, in the world. They've got hatred, hatred that's happening just because you're, you're one race or another. It's just, again, you don't really need to go to the courthouse. You could just go to our um, nursery, by the way. You can find out where it all starts. Go, help out in the nursery. As a matter of fact, we do need volunteers. You will then recognize the bent toward evil when the one kid, the one two-year-old, crawls over to the other kid, grabs the toy from the other kid, and kicks the kid, and then walks away. We don't teach your kids to do that, by the way. We don't. They, and by the way, they didn't learn it from the neighbor's kids. I love that. Oh, my kid never does that. He must have learned it from the neighbor's kids. No, he learned that all in his own. He did that by himself. Creative acts, that's, he wanted that toy. Ah, where am I? I? This is where it happens. I get off topic. Uh, but you know what Jesus does say? Even though we are evil, you know what he says? And I love this. We're not utterly evil all the time because we can give good gifts to our children. You know, we're not utterly evil all the time. When God says that we're sinners and we're bent toward evil, that's not all the time. As a matter of fact, there are some people that do really good things that most of the time they're not doing good things. Um, you, uh, some of you men have seen great acts of heroism and valor on the battlefield of people who don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord that are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, there have been donations made by billionaires that just, you know, they'll write a $100 million check to help uh, put wells in Africa, and they'll do that. And I'm, I always ask, but well, where'd they get the billion dollars from to give the $100 million? Was that all legitimate? Again, we can give good gifts, and, and God says that. We can give good gifts and love our children like we should. And we can do brave and heroic acts. But we cannot sustain such a high ethical standard or please a holy God without a Holy Spirit. This leads me to another rabbit trail, sorry. Um, You know, we can't handle uh, life's pressures without God in this world. And as you tried, and I've tried to live without God, Maybe you uh, were brought up in a church, maybe you didn't have this happen to you, but, you know, um, some of us came to Christ late in life, and in those first 20 years of our life, we were fighting the world. We were constantly fighting the world. And I really believe with the Holy Spirit, there was no peace in my life. Without the Holy Spirit, there was no peace in my life. If we desire to live righteously, uh, we, we, we needed strength. We need to ask for strength from God. We need to seek for wisdom. We need to be knocking at heaven's door every situation to get grace for each day. As I came to Christ, all of a sudden, my, my life was started to get together, and all of a sudden, I solved different things in my world, and, and then all of a sudden, I, I started living out my faith. And, but there was other things that happened, like people started to say, how come you're not going drinking with me? Or how come all of a sudden you're telling the truth? Or... Uh, whatever it was. How come you don't laugh at the same jokes? They saw a difference in me, and all of a sudden I lost a lot of friends, a lot of relationships. But at the same time, God gave me so much more. And some of the people that I rightly related to that were some of my friends came to church with me, and they also trusted Jesus as their Savior, and they became eternal friends, eternal friends. So, we need God, and we also need him even when we come to Jesus Christ, because uh, we need him every day. All right, let me go down this other rabbit trail. You know, by the way, I'm I'm going down a lot of rabbit trails today. Have you ever heard anybody say this? God will never 
give you more than you can handle. How many people, uh, this I want to know, how many people have ever heard that before? All right, God will never give you more than you can handle, right? Uh, This is not in the Bible, by the way. If you're going to look it up, it's not there. Uh, There is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, God will not let you be tempted to sin beyond what you can bear, and he will provide a way out so that you can stand against the temptation. That's what the Bible says. The whole idea, the devil made me do it, is a bad excuse because God, in this verse, will always give you a way out. You don't have to sin. You're on a stand in trial and you, you want to lie, and, and they ask you this very personal question, and if you lie, you just walk away. God says, don't lie. Don't bear false witness. Tell the truth. And you tell the truth. And by the way, sometimes it's very refreshing when a politician tells the truth, isn't it? After some investigations, finally, a two-year investigation, and the guy says, yeah, I did it. Well, we all knew you did it, but why didn't you just say that? It would save the taxpayers hundreds, well, even millions of dollars. Um, The thing about it is, God says, when you are tempted, he will give you a way out. So you say, well, God... You know, I had to sin. No, you didn't. That is the truth. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not the truth. That's, I don't think it's a biblical. What about Job? Do you think God gave him more than he could handle? Come on. Take, take other characters in the scripture. Take Mike Gerhard's life. There are times when I can't handle it. And it drives me to my knees. And, and you know, God's not up there and saying, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have given you something that you couldn't handle. No. Our international workers that are in countries where they kill Christians are facing things that they can't handle. That's why we pray for them here. They can't handle it. And they're on their knees every night. And we need to be on our knees every night. Those situations drive us to the grace of God. Again, Chris even mentioned it this morning, and, and, and these are situations that are coming up. He just now is praying for every single situation. God will give you things that you can't handle. And that's the time when he wants you to come to him and pray, ask, seek, and find, and knock. On, t- on heaven's door. Okay. Did I get through that? I hope so. Um, Matthew chapter 8 says this. This is another topic. Uh, do not be like them. By the way, if you're looking through the outline, and I don't have the outline, we're getting back to the outline, all right? Finally, we're going to get back to the outline. If I noticed that none of you are looking at the outline. They're probably opening up the book and says, is this the same ceremony he's doing? Do not be like them. Matthew says, And this is, by the way, part of the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at this before. Do not be like the Pharisees and Sadducees that pray with lots and lots of words. The Pharisees and Sadducees got up and on the street corners and prayed and acted holy and had all these memorized prayers. It says, don't don't be like, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. It brings up another question, right? Right? So then why ask? Doesn't it make sense? If he knows all my needs... Just give me the needs, God. I don't, I don't need to ask for them because you already know. Right? Well, actually, there's a reason why we ask. Our prayers show a dependence on the Holy Spirit for all that we need. Our prayers confirm a constant dependence. We need to pray to see God's world from God's viewpoint. When I spend time with God in prayer, and usually I, I try not to do my list of here's what I want. But if I do have a list, I give them what I want, and I say, all right, now what do you want, God? What's on your heart, God? Try that, by the way. Ask God what's on his mind. 
I would think it's the Christians in North Africa, to tell you the truth, that just came to Christ that are being threatened, their lives are being threatened. I think that's on his mind. I think Palestine area is on his mind. I think Ukraine is on his mind. Ask God what's on his heart. And you can spend time in prayer. You get to that point where you start to realize there are bigger things out there to pray for than the oil change I need in my car. That's what God wants. He wants you to be thinking about your neighbor, your boss, your friends that don't know Jesus Christ. He wants you to put them on your list. He wants you to put your hard heart toward your parents or your siblings and forgive them. That's what he wants you to pray about. We pray for these things. (sighs) What do you want for Christmas? God's not asking that question. He's asking you to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right. We look at the golden rule. Jesus ends with this. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So tell me, what does the golden rule apply to? What's What's the quantity that is here? Do unto others that you would have. Is this just in certain situations? It's in everything. Should you pay your taxes? Do unto others as you would do, you know, you would want them to do to you. Somebody owed you money? Would you pay them? Or you would want them to pay you? It, it's in everything. And, and what's the quality? It's how you would want it. How you would want it. If you don't want it done that way, make sure that you do for others as you would want them to do to you. So there's this quantity, which is everything, and there's this quality that is on on you. Um, and by the way, this is very interesting, and I hope this wakes up some of you. Many religions have this same saying in the negative. Many of religions have this. Matter of fact, the Jewish rabbi Halel said this: "What is hateful to you, or what is um, hateful, uh, do not do to others. If you hate it being done to you, then don't do it to others." Right? The Book of Tobit in the uh, Apocrypha actually taught. What you yourself hate, to no man do. Confucius, who lived before Jesus, said, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. What did Jesus do? He changed that completely. It was always in the negative. If you you hate it being done to you, then don't do it to others. He turned it into proactive. You do for others what you would want them to do to you. So you start out doing. And you don't do it to others so that they would do it to you. No, that's not the saying. You do to others what you would want them to do to you. It's a proactive and not inactive. Jesus turned it around. The golden rule is not, by the way, total uh, truth of the Bible nor is it God's plan of redemption. It's just the way we should act as Christians. That's the way we should act. That's what he's trying to tell us, the golden rule. We should no more build our theology on the golden rule, which, by the way, some religions do, than to build our astronomy on twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, th- that would not work. And, and, and some people will say the, the golden rule should be, you know, our, our theme of... No, the golden rule is what we should do. But we are to be saints. We are to do God's will. We are to pray for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. It applies to believers. I've said this many times. Uh, prayer and the golden rule belongs to the, the uh, believers. And, and again, when you think about that, refuse to say or do anything that would not be what you would want for yourself. That is a huge, huge way in which we should live. Practicing the golden rule releases the love of God in our lives, enables us to help others, even those who don't like us. We are to be salt, and salt sometimes stings an open wound, but we are to be light, and light sometimes exposes the dirt, but we are to do what we would want people to do to us. Uh, Again, think about that. 
We are to live out God's grace so that the world will see. To live out kingdom values, to do kingdom works, to serve and love others, and to be agents of God's grace. We are to be a channel of His blessing. You may be the answer to your own prayer. As you pray for somebody, you may be the answer to go and deliver a, a, a basket of cookies to them this Christmas. How many plates of cookies that you could give out with a little uh, invitation on, on that plate of cookies? Think about that, to be the blessing. Wouldn't you want someone to do that to you? Do it to others. And be the grace that God wants you to be. I'm going to close with just uh, one story, uh, a personal story. Uh, it was years ago when our son Trevor was six years old. I looked it up. Uh, we encouraged our sons to come up with only three things that they wanted. Uh, one was we, we, our, we would tell the parents, our parents to get them because usually it was the most expensive of the three. I was a pastor, you remember, uh, what they wanted, and we would get them two other things. Um, Trevor, our son, middle son, finally gave us a list on December 23rd. We had already gotten his gifts, and they were already wrapped. And I, 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 was, I was looking at Jen. I'm looking at the list. I said, Jen, I can get these gifts tonight. And she says, no way. It's not in the budget. You were just going to have to give them the gifts that we got. I was, I was up all night uh, Christmas Eve because we, we exchanged gifts on Christmas Day. I'm thinking, oh, he's going to be so upset, you know, and he gave us the list. I mean, usually the kids don't, for, they forget about it, but he actually gave, the other two, I don't think they gave us the list. They could care. But anyway, so we, what we do is we only, open, maybe you do this, we only open one present at a time. It was, you know, Janet's turn. And Brand's turn, and Trevor's turn, and Eric's. And you couldn't open another present until everybody was finished. You all looked at the presents. Because, you know, we didn't have that many presents, so it kind of made it look like we had lots of presents. All right. So after uh, all the presents were opened, and every time uh, Trevor opened a present, oh, this is great. This is all. Oh, this is the best thing. Oh, great. After breakfast, we had pancakes and everything. He comes up to me and says, Dad, this is the greatest Christmas I've ever had. I got everything I wanted. And I tell you, I remember that. Because our Father has given us good gifts all the time. And we don't see it. We are giving him our lists and being disappointed. Can we throw away the lists? Can we just know that he loves us? My son Trevor was such an example of being thanked for getting the gifts that he didn't put on his list. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer. Father God, Jesus teaches us to pray and to ask, to seek, and to knock. He also teaches us to be servants of yours, to be kingdom saints, to show the love of Jesus wherever we are, all the time. And during this season, Lord, when people do respond to a plate of cookies and an invitation to Christmas Eve service, may we get outside our comfort zones and do for others as we would have them do for us. Oh, I pray that we would be uh, a beacon of light to this dark world as we pray this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's uh, sing this last song to God.